Welcome to the episode. Before we get into the content, as usual, I'd love to play a mind game with you, the viewer at home. The only thing that this mind game requires is a good memory. In fact, it doesn't really require a good memory, but if you have a terrible memory, pause the video now, run, grab a pen and a piece of paper, and we'll be waiting for you. Ready to play? This experiment's gonna be using these symbols. And if you don't recognize these symbols, they're referred to as ESP symbols. And these would usually be printed onto pieces of card. Now in the early 1900s, these symbols were used to test for psychic ability. So how do you test for someone's psychic ability? Well, what they do is they take a person and put them in a lab and there'd be a conductor, which in this case is me, and a sitter, which would be you. And they take one of these pieces of card or symbols and they place them face down on the table and the sitter would have to try intuitively pick up on what symbol had been placed face down. Now, if you got one or two of these right, it would generally considered probability or guesswork. Three of these were fairly rare, four or five of these were unheard of. If you got five of these right, you were definitely psychic, and I'd love to test your psychic ability. So if you get five of these, tell me in the comments that you're a psychic. Are you ready to play? I want you to imagine instead of you taking this test or you playing this game, I want you to imagine it's somebody else, a friend or a family member that has never seen these symbols before. Imagine that they're holding on to these five symbols. And what I want you to do now, if you're using a piece of paper, is just write the numbers one to five. If you're doing this mentally, just imagine the numbers one to five. Imagine that your friend or family member takes out the symbol from all these symbols that they consider their favorite. So taking out the symbol they consider their favorite one and you write that into slot number one or mentally commit to it and put it into slot number one. For symbol number two, I want you to imagine they look at the remaining symbols, the ones that are left, because we've obviously got rid of the first one. And just imagine the symbol that they least recognize, the one that just doesn't gel, it doesn't belong with the rest. And write that into slot number two or commit to it as the second symbol. For the third symbol, we're gonna do something slightly different. I want you to imagine a simple doodle like uh, a stick man or a ball or a flower or the sun or something like that, but please don't go for those things. Just something you could doodle relatively quickly. Think about the shape of this thing. Then look at the remaining symbols and then take out the one that you feel best represents the shape of the doodle that you've drawn. So now we've got three symbols, we're left with two. These symbols are made up of shapes and designs. The shapes are obviously the square and the circle. The designs are the star, the wavy lines and the plus symbol. If you're left with a design, a star, a plus or a wavy lines, that's the one we're gonna write into number four or commit to in number four. And that leaves us with one symbol. Wouldn't it be amazing if the symbol that you're left with is the one that I'm thinking of right now? Are you thinking of the circle for the last symbol? Well, like I said, that'd only be guesswork. If we got the rest of these right though, that'd be amazing. In position number one, did you put the star? Position number two, did you put the wavy lines? Number three, did you put a square? And in number four, that obviously leaves the plus symbol. How did you do? Let me know in the comments how psychic you are. If you manage to think of the drawing of a house, you're extremely psychic. Subscribe to the channel, let me know how you did. Let's get on with this video. So this is the fourth time we're trying to record this. So I'm hoping that we have some success this time. The first time I'd ordered some food and the waitress brought the food over mid explanation. Then it started to rain during the second time we tried to record this. The third time I got out of the rain into the shelter at the bar and it was like a sound trap. It just kept echoing car noises and dogs and everything else. And I thought, you know what? 
I have more respect for my audience than this. So in the rain, I jumped on my bike, I rode back home, I've set up a camera, I've grabbed a beer, and I'm gonna share with you the things that I wanted to share with good audio and good video. So during the last episode, I talked about building confidence and how to gain confidence in your own performances. And at the end of that video, I said that one of the biggest ways to knock your confidence is to encounter a heckler. Now, I'm gonna teach you a series of tricks and tips to get hecklers on side, to deal with hecklers, and show you how you can turn an experience like that from something that you avoid to something that you actively encourage, which sounds really strange, but all the conventional advice that I've found online on how to deal with hecklers, most of it is not good advice. Not good for the time that we're in, not good for the world that we're living in. If you talk to the old guard, they'll say, oh, just ignore hecklers, and that's fine for them that were fine back in their time when there were no mobile telephones and no social media nowadays if somebody starts to heckle you and your show goes downhill you can bet that somebody's recording that and you can bet that it's going to end up on social media and you don't want that for your brand you don't want that for your character you don't want that for your confidence so what advice would i give well firstly you need to understand why you're being heckled you need to understand what it is that's causing those moments, what it is that's causing somebody to be a smart ass, what situations are you finding yourself in where these people are behaving that way. Now, I performed and cut my teeth in working men's clubs and run down bars and performing for gypsy families. And those type of venues, people were writing mid-performance, people were fighting, people were smashing windows, and the staff would say, if you don't finish your performance, you're not getting paid. So you imagine sitting there in the middle of a performance and all the windows are being smashed around you. I was filming a segment for Channel 4, and this never got aired. I was working with Channel 4 at the time, and they asked me if I wanted to do a show about um, performing at a gypsy wedding. And I, at this gypsy wedding, and then it all just started to riot. The bar started getting smashed up, the windows started getting smashed. Another performance, somebody got their thumb bitten off, they bit their own mother's thumb off and then smashed the bar up afterwards. Uh, another one I were at were like a, not a wake, but almost a celebration of somebody that had passed away. And I were in the middle of a QA and a routine and then this whole bar just started rioting and the woman that were on stage when we said, you better finish what you're doing. So I just, I just stood there amongst the writing and finished, you know? Um, those are the types of performance that I had to encounter to learn this type of stuff. So point number one is why are you being heckled? Have you said something? Have you done something? Or have you triggered a response that's allowed a window of opportunity for a heckler? Let me give you a, a quick insight into what I mean. So imagine that you walk up to a table and you say to somebody, I'm a mind reader. Can I sit down and show you some stuff? Well, what's going to happen there is the moment that you say, I'm a mind reader, you've opened the gateway, opened the doors for somebody to say, you're a mind reader. All right. If you're a mind reader, what am I thinking now? That's the most common response to that statement. Now, usually you'll find that that happens right out of the gate. And performers will say to you, don't rise to it. Say something like, well, it doesn't really work that way. I've got to have you think a certain way in order to be able to get inside your head and do this. That's the wrong way to approach it. You need to shut it down and you need to shut it down fast. And this is how you shut down that statement if you ever encounter it. So let's pretend that I'm sat across from somebody and they say, well, go on, then if you're a mind reader, tell me what I'm thinking now. And I just smile and say, you're thinking about denying the next thing that I say to you. And if they go, no, I'm not, you go. And everybody else at the table laughs, boom, heckler gone, destroyed. There's only two responses they can give. One, no, I'm not. Two, am I? And then I say, if you don't know your own mind, how do you expect me to know it? But let's all discover it together. You know, that type of thing. There is a third response where they can go very good and they figure out the fact that you beat them and you're one step ahead. But the beauty is at that point, you've now just created a moment that's so perfect, it's not to be avoided. And it's this, you say, we've already figured out who the skeptic is in the group. So I'd love to play a game or you know, have a little bit of fun with you. If you take this, I'm gonna ask you to write this down. Now, the reason I'm gonna ask you to write it down is because we've all just worked out that you're the skeptic of the group and you're likely to change your mind to try to catch me out. Well, now you've got a reason for them to write something down. If you were doing something with playing cards, let's say you were gonna force a playing card and then read somebody's mind, and I'm using inverted commas because you forced the card, but you're making it seem like a piece of mind reading. What you can do at that point is you say, you know, I normally have somebody think of a card 
and then I'd read their mind. But with you, I know that you're going to change your mind halfway through and make me look silly. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to spread these out, and let's say using the cohorts. I want you just to touch the back of one of them, that one, and I'm looking down at the marking. Take it out, put it to your chest. Because you're not sceptical, I want you just to think of any playing card. So now think what's happened here, right? So I've looked at the marking, I know what this card is. This person's a skeptic, there's a reason for them to pick the card. This person, you've just asked them to think of one. So what do you do? You say, now I'm gonna start at this side because you're already partly a believer in this sort of stuff and I don't feel you're gonna change your mind. Look at me, just imagine saying it. Just focus on what the color is of your, oh, you're giving this away far too easily. Now I go through the deck, my deck, the second one, and I pull out the duplicate of the card that they took, or if I'm using one deck, I'll ask them to show everybody else it. Now by them showing everybody else it, they can't change their mind. So let's pretend we're doing this with either two decks or one, they show it to everybody else, put it back in, mix them up, I don't need to touch them. You're thinking of a card, imagine telling me it. Now I take this deck, I go through and I, whilst I'm talking to this person, take out that card. So I take the card out, put it down, I think that's it, I push that towards them. What card are you thinking of? And they say six of clubs. Well, obviously I know I've not put the six of clubs down. I've put their card down, but that doesn't matter. Watch this. And I just lean and say, take a look. And then as they go to touch it, I say, in fact, you know what? Let me try to get yours as well. Now I go through and take the six of clubs out. That's called a one ahead. Take the six of clubs out. I put it down. I say, now you picked one out because you know you were going to change your mind, but you just thought of one. You never told me what your card was. And then I've got rid of the rest of the deck. What were your card? So we have the six of clubs and the four of diamonds. And all I do at this point is just drop them down. Six of clubs in front of this person, four of diamonds in front of that person. Boom, you've nailed two playing cards. You could do that with writing down. Once you've peeked at what it is that they've written, you're one ahead now to nail what this person's thinking of and they can think of anything. But it makes logical sense. So you've shut the person down and then you've responded nice and quickly but you've not shut them down in a nasty way where you've responded with something negative, and that's important. But look at the introduction or the way that you've approached the person. That's what it is that elicited the response. You said, I'm a mind reader. Go on, then read my mind. If you tell somebody that I'm a sleight of hand expert, and then you sit down, they're gonna be watching for the sleight of hand. Whereas, let's say that you're a magician, a sleight of hand expert. I can create a moment at a table where I can ruin the experience for the, the heckler before it started. I can stop them from being able to speak. This is the greatest piece of advice that you're ever gonna get on heckling, because it stops it. So let's imagine that you're on stage, or you're in a close-up performance, whatever, but you're talking to everybody at the same time. You then turn to everybody and you say, let's say you're a sleight of hand artist first, and we'll do this with a mind reader. In the past, I've been called by multiple people are sleight of hand expert. I don't consider myself a sleight of hand expert, but there's obviously techniques that I'm using to do what I do. I'm not claiming to be a genuine wizard. There are techniques and methods that I'm employing to show you things that I guarantee you've never seen before. And you can watch this from one of two perspectives. One, you could try to figure out the moves that I'm using and see if you can catch me out inside your head. Or two, you could just sit back and ignore all of that and enjoy the experience. I'd recommend enjoying the experience because then you'll witness things that you've never seen before in your life. But if you do choose to watch what it is that I'm doing and you do choose to try to figure it out, there's other people at this table that have decided that they wanna sit back and enjoy the experience. So don't ruin it for your friends. Keep it inside your own head because that's not their choice and they didn't choose to know how some of this stuff were done. So with that said, let's begin. Well, look what you've just done now. No longer are they heckling you anymore. If they open their mouth now, they have to be the arsehole that ruins it for everybody else. And if they do start to ruin it for everybody else, everybody else is now going to jump on that person and stop them doing it. And you can do the same with mind reading. Instead of sitting down and saying to everybody at the table, I'm a mind reader, or I'm a psychic, or I'm a body language expert, don't claim what it is that you do. So you could play a little game with them. So let's say, for example, it, you were gonna describe how you do what you do. So everybody's sat there and you say, I often get asked how I do what I do. Now there's obvious techniques that I use. There's little tricks that I use 
with the mind and little techniques that I use to influence people and subtly suggest things to people. And sometimes I'm using body language, sometimes I'm trusting my own intuition, and sometimes it's just out and out probability. But to give you an example of how strange the mind is, and you could try this at home, if I asked you what C-A-L spell, what does C-A-L spell? Cal, right? Okay, so C-A-L spells Cal. What does V-E-S spell? V-E-S, Ves. So C-A-L spells Cal and V-E-S spells Ves. If you were to put those two things together, what do you get? If you answered Calves, you were wrong, it's Calves. C-A-L-V-E-S. But it shows you how you can change just one little thing and trick the brain into seeing or believing something else. And that's exactly what I'll be doing tonight. Now you can watch this from one of two perspectives. The first perspective, you could try to figure out what it is that I'm doing and where I'm implying probability or where I'm applying body language or where I'm just out and out guessing. Or you could just take a step back, relax and enjoy the experience. If you, however, choose to look for what it is I'm doing, don't ruin it for everybody else because they've not chose to try to figure this stuff out. And again, you've stopped it before it happened. That's important. Find out what's happening occurring, you know, reoccurringly at your performances. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm still, uh, I'm still tired from last night, but I really wanted to get this video done. So just to give you an insight into what I was doing last night, I was last night planning a trip uh, to go up to Scotland and I was consulting and doing some other bits. I didn't end up getting to bed till about five, six in the morning. I had two hours sleep and I was back up again because I wanted to do this video today. So think about what's occurring or reoccurring at your own performances. What do I mean by that? What's reoccurring at your performances? Well, if you find that somebody's saying to you, huh, can you make my wife disappear? Which is something that we've all had. It's something that's happened to all of us. Then use that. Don't try to shy away from it or run away from it or hide from it. Use it. What I'd do is I'd open my wallet and inside my wallet I'd put somebody with dark hair will come up to me and say, can you make my wife disappear? Question mark. The answer is no, but I totally knew you were going to ask me. Full stop. Then in your pocket, put one that says a gentleman with light colored hair will approach me and ask, can you make my wife disappear? Question mark. The answer is no, but I totally knew you were going to ask me. And then put one envelope in your wallet, one in your pocket. Remember which one that you've put where. And if that happens now, you say, you know, you're never going to believe this. Reach into my top pocket for a second. Now, if they've got light hair, they reach into the top pocket. If it's dark hair, it comes out of the wallet. But now you've predicted the moment that they're going to say that. If there's other things that occur in your show over and over again, why not make them into a prediction? You know, it becomes interesting and it becomes something that seems more impossible and more fun. And it turns it on its head. You get a joke and a moment for everybody else that they watch it and go, this guy is unbelievable. You know, and it stops being just a question that gets asked all the time. Sometimes think about the way that you approach routines and routining. You know, I, I mean, I can't remember the the name of this routine, but it's a routine where you text, say, $10 bills and you flick them and it turns into hundreds. Now, I'm not really up on sleight of hand and magic products that are on the market, but think about that, right? Let's say that you've taken a 10 or a 20 and there's a row of them and then you've shaken them and all of a sudden they turn into $100 bills. All night you're going to get people saying to you, can you take my 20 and turn it into 100? Can you take my 10? I've got $5 here. I'll give you half of it if you could turn it into $100. Well, think about what the audience have experienced. They've experienced something visually transforming from one thing to another. And in, in a nutshell, that's the feat of the magic. So if you apply a reverse sort of theory there and you say, you know, I've been working on this new magic trick that's going to make me more rich than any other magic trick, but I've not perfected it yet. Does anybody want to see it? And they'll say yes. And now what you do is you take out a bunch of 20s, right? And you say, now, once I've refined this, I won't be coming to gigs anymore. I'll just sit at home doing this all day. Say 20, 20, 20. Watch what happens. I'm going to try to turn these into hundreds. Boom. And I'll turn them into dollar bills. 
and everybody jumps back and it's like, whoa, what's just happened? These have just changed into dollars. And you look at them and you look a little bit annoyed and you go, that's half my fee gone. Does anybody have a couple of 20s that I can borrow? And not one person at the table is going to give you a $20 bill, but they'll erupt in laughter because you've opened up that line. And I can guarantee to you that not one person is going to turn around and say, can you do it with my bill? Because they don't want to devalue the money that they've got, right? And that's the approach. It's using your own mentality to understand that you're opening up a window for these people to react the way that they're reacting, right? You know, think about the approach. Uh, another one is in mentalism, because you can predict the future, something happens in the show that wasn't meant to happen, like somebody drops a load of plates or whatever, you always get, but you didn't see that coming, did you? So I used to plan for that. You know, when I were doing stage shows, I'd, I'd take a, a piece of paper and I'd write at 8.45 this evening, somebody from the audience will shout, you didn't see that coming, did you? And I'd screw it up into a bowl and I'd go out and I'd, about 8.45 I'd do a little bit of a speech about how I can predict the future, throw a paper ball and then make something happen by accident, like I'd knock something off or um, I'd trigger something to happen so that it elicited one of the members to jump up and go... One of the audience members, you didn't see that coming, did you? And I'd say, well, actually, by my watch, I make it 8.45. Does everybody else have that? Open that paper ball for me and I'd get a reaction, right? Now, if you can find a system where you can swap a playing card, so let's say that you've got a card case that does it for you or you can find a system that's used to swap something in or if you are good at card under glass, we know card under glass. Well, instead of using it as card under bottle or card under glass, Imagine that somebody drops a plate over this way at 26 minutes past seven, right? Note the time when it happens and everybody else is reacting. During the next routine, perform, write, when you're writing something, write 7.26, one of the waitresses will drop plates, dot, dot, dot. And now wait until a moment of offbeat and then load that under a glass while somebody's doing something else. Just let the rest of your performance play out and then at the end say, you know, we talked about predicting the impossible. We've shared secrets. I've guessed things that you're thinking of. I've read your mind. There were one thing that happened tonight where somebody turned around and said, you didn't see that coming, did you? Can everybody remember what it was? The plates. Now, you've had your glass there in front of you the entire time with your beer mat on top of it. I've been nowhere near it, correct? Yeah. Lift up your beer mat a second and you'll see what I put under there right at the start of the performance. And they lift it up and you say, just turn it round. It says at 7.26, a waitress will drop plates or whatever. And everybody will go absolutely crazy because you've loaded that in after the fact. Use these moments as predictions. Use them as tools to bolster and make your performances seem more impossible. Paint them red. You know, if there's a problem in the routine, and let's say it's you need to do an extreme piece of sleight of hand, I have a routine where it involves me having to do sleight of hand, and I'm not very good at sleight of hand. So instead of trying to do sleight of hand, I made a moment in performance that makes it seem fairer for them if they're shuffling the cards under the table. So I have to swap a couple of cards out whilst I'm under the table. So what I'll do is I'll say, does anybody know what shuffle tracking is? Well, shuffle tracking is the idea that if you watch somebody shuffling a deck of cards, you can track the order of the deck so you'll know where certain cards are. Makes sense, right? How do you stop being able to shuffle track somebody? Well, you shuffle the cards so you can't see them. It makes it much more impossible. Take them under the table and mix them. Well, now the cards are under the table and you say, I'll tell you what, hand me half of them and I'll mix them as well. So now you don't know the order of my packet. I wasn't looking at my packet whilst I shuffled them. I don't know the order of your packet. You shuffled them. Let's swap and keep them under there. In fact, somebody else shuffled my pack. Well, the work's done now. And I used the cover of the table. I didn't need to perform an extreme piece of sleight of hand. I didn't need to do that, right? So it's just about taking time to think about what's going to occur in your performances and then utilizing it and utilizing those people as people that are going to help you. Now, let's talk about bringing somebody on side. Let's say, for example, this person at the side of me says, I'm a, I'm a medium, I'm a psychic, I've got intuitive abilities. Well, when they say to, when everybody at the table is saying, how do you do that? Instead of saying, well, I'm not a psychic, <laughs> I'm not a medium, I'm not intuitive. Don't say that, just omit giving details. Say, you know, I'm not quite sure how I do it, I just sort of do it. I mean, maybe, maybe you'd be able to describe it better than me. I'm not, 
not really at a point where I can just, I just do it, you know, and I'm fairly accurate at it. And she will turn to her friends or he will turn to her friends or this person will turn to their friends and say, it's intuition. He's psychic. I'm telling you, I can feel it. I know it. I deal with this stuff all the time. They now are the credible source that proves the point to everybody else, right? They're the one that's proving it to everyone that you're a psychic. You don't need to say you are. And then if anybody calls you on it later on online, say, oh, I never said that I was. I just said that I wasn't sure. I didn't want to offend anybody at the table. There's your out. Let's say, for example, somebody says, I know what you're doing. It's body language. Instead of turning to that person and saying, no, I'm a psychic. I don't use body language. I use intuition. And arguing and creating a moment where it's all highlight for this person, what I do is I turn to this person and say, oh, great. So you'll know some of the techniques that I'm using. Some of this is body language. Some of it's just intuition. Other bits of it is probability and guesswork. And some of it, I couldn't tell you how I do it. But that's great because you have an understanding in this stuff. So when I'm showing everybody something, you'll see the moments I'm doing something. So now perform a routine that doesn't use any body language, but make it seem like you're doing something like just touch the person's arm or nod at the person as you say something or whatever. And then you turn to this person and say, did you see me using the body language in that? And they'll go, yeah, I saw it because they don't want to seem stupid by saying, no, I never saw you doing anything because this person's supposedly a body language expert. So why would they not want to admit to seeing something? It just, it just kills the first point that they ever made. So it's, it keeps that, it keeps that successive motion. They're the one that's giving you credibility now, right? It's so easy. You see, when you're looking at it like this, it's an art form in itself, but when you're looking like this, it becomes so easy to do. So let's take the last example, and this is gonna be the last thing that I share. The last example is, what happens if this person's just been a pain in the ass? I don't believe any of this. I don't believe any of this shit. Oh, it's all bollocks. It doesn't work, can't work. Instead of trying to argue with this person and perform for this person, which is a mistake that every single mentalist I've seen, and I've seen it, they'll focus an entire show around the heckler and neglect everybody else. Say to that person, you know what? Come here a second, let's try this. And now do a spectator as mind reader routine where they're the mind reader and they're guessing what everybody else is doing or a routine that involves them having to guess what other people think. Now there's two things that are gonna happen. One, they're not gonna make themselves look stupid by just saying silly things. And if they do, you can say, well, you're not really trying. But two, think about this for a second. This person now has to actively work on everybody else. And when it does work, they have to admit that they were wrong because they've just managed to do it. And you can say, well, you managed to do this and that's just what I'm doing. Just trusting the same instincts and same intuition and you've seen it for yourself. So now this person has to remain quiet for the rest of the performance or this person can be the judge and just use steady, really reliable methods and routines where this person helps you out and is judging the entire thing or is part of the process where they read people. So skeptics, hecklers, it's not a difficult thing. It's not something that you need to worry about. It's not a thing that you need to panic about. Just integrate them into the performance. Find ways to make predictions so that they become part of the performance and you predict it ahead of time. And a true professional knows that they're getting into a situation where that's gonna happen. And all of a sudden what you'll find is that if you're thinking about what you're saying on the approach, you're reducing the window of opportunity for hecklers to speak. You're dealing with hecklers retrospectively. You're predicting what people are gonna say in advance. You're stopping opening yourself up like with the notes for moments of ridicule. All of a sudden the scope for people being able to heckle you goes from this and it reduces itself right down to next to nothing. And then you have to start finding ways to force hecklers to say things to you just so that you can use them in the show. So I really hope that this 10, 15 minutes has been a really knowledgeable 10, 15 minutes and you've taken something away from it. And I really hope that you apply this stuff because I've spent a lifetime creating this stuff and working around hecklers and skeptics and everything else. And I hope that it helps you take your performances to the next level. Guys, take care. Until next time, 